Hello to this episode of um, Persons of the Future Mobility. Today I am really honored to um, have an interview with Peter Sorgenfrei. Peter, please, in Peter, introduce yourself. This is Peter Sorgenfrei. The last 20 years I've spent in and around the automotive category. I spent 13 years in New York City working for Daimler Chrysler, Toyota, and uh, some Wall Street analysts analyzing the future of car makers and suppliers. And then I built my own companies advising uh, Toyota, Mazda, Renault, BMW about their future uh, looking 25 to 50 years out. Today, I'm based in Copenhagen in Denmark, where I'm from, and have spent the last three years uh, built an autonomous mobility provider into the largest uh, owner of autonomous shuttles. In um, so we are in the core of the future mobility. This is quite an advanced and so quite sophisticated business model. But how would you characterize that? Is it? Are you a manufacturer of autonomous vehicles, or you are a, a provider of mobility service? more or less a service company. What people have to imagine is in the future, and even today, some companies are going to produce autonomous vehicles and some people are going to access autonomous vehicles. And in between the two is going to be the role of an operator. That's the company that purchases or leases vehicles, puts them into service by getting permissions from local and state governments, uh, operates them as they're running in the streets, connects them to consumers, connects them to other PTAs, public transport authorities, and make the entire system work. And that role of the operator is that what my company does. Company, uh, uh, software company, a pure software company, or the, are there hardware elements integrated? And what's the complete function of your company within the future of mobility? It's a combination of software and practical mechanical stuff. Because when you think of it, if you're running a, a train service or a regular bus service, you need to have mechanics, you need to have maintenance crews, you need to have people on board uh, these vessels. And there's a lot of of practical things that have to go into autonomous shuttles or autonomous cars. You don't just put them on the road and they drive. Uh, and all the stuff around them that already uh, cars and tests or um, is it just momentum and just ideas or do you really test autonomous vehicles in, in, in circumstances uh, as in, in traffic situations? It is in the city. As you would drive a regular car on regular roads with roundabouts and traffic lights and pedestrians, they're just running by themselves. There's no a test in a in a closed environment, or is it really really a test within the city in mixed traffic? Or this this is would be quite interesting to me. In, in Germany, we have. Uh, tests, but they are in a closed environment. They are in the in, 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 in university uh, areas, which is, which is not really uh, open for public transport or for the public. It's in a closed environment. It's a clear and stable circumstances for autonomous cars. First of all, Jürgen, I understand that you're a little surprised because that's what makes our company unique. We're basically the only ones who are operating in mixed traffic. Um, and the experience so far is the vehicles are uh, very careful. Uh, so we haven't had any accidents. We haven't run into anything and nobody has run into us. Uh, but we are experiencing that other people in cars around us have to get used to the fact that we follow the speed limit, that we stop at stop signs, these kind of things. And um, that's uh, that's one of our main learnings is that people who drive cars are not very patient when it comes to an autonomous shuttle that follows all the rules. The big problem is more or less the the uh, car driver or the the um, the person in the city 
who is not really familiar with this new technology, or is it the technology is by far rather than a far further and more established or more sophisticated than than the average person in this city? Is this right? Uh, uh, yeah, but it's not black and white. Of course, we are learning a lot about what the technology can and cannot do. Uh, we're seeing what happens when, for example, we have road construction on our route. Right now, there's not an autonomous system that can understand how to navigate uh, construction sites. So that's something we still have to help the vehicle by manually overtaking and steering them around construction, for example. In your tests, which uh, challenge you have to overcome? Uh, is it more the speed? In Germany, we we testing in the, with the average speed between 20, between 20 or 30 kilometers per hour. Um, I heard of some tests with uh, trucks which go up to 80 or 90 miles an hour. But uh, what are the main challenges you have to um, for to, to to tackle in your tests in the Nordic countries? I think there are there are two things that we're hoping to do. One, yes, we want to increase the speed, but as you just pointed out, in many environments, we actually don't have to go much faster than somewhere between twenty and thirty kilometers an hour for it to flow with other traffic. So we don't have to go that much faster. The other thing that we want to improve is for the vehicle to be more independent. As I mentioned, if we have construction sites, we have to help the vehicle. If something is blocking the vehicle and we have to, to change lanes, we have to help it. So we need to build in more autonomy in the vehicle to handle sort of special circumstances. Is there still a driver on board in your tests, or is it completely autonomous, or do you use a driver who is not really at the uh, in the car, or is it a supervised situation via the internet and via sensor data or uh, camera pictures? How we, we should how we should we um, Envision this this test in in uh, Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen and Gothenburg. So so we we are we're supervising all our vehicles from our central location here in Copenhagen, but we will not remote control the vehicles. And the reason for that is there is still too much of a latency in the data transmission on the cell networks that it's too dangerous to remote control the vehicles which is why we're also happy to have somebody in the vehicle to help it if it needs help. Do you have partners in your projects on your test, or is it just you are a company which is testing, or is it, is it right now schon integrated in the public transport in Copenhagen and Gothenburg? Uh, no, it's we, we have partners. We have the city of Gothenburg is, is one. We have a uh, parking company. We have a real estate developer. And uh, we have a private fund that is financing. In Gothenburg and Copenhagen are, are open for the public, or is it just a test uh, with special clients um, to show the potential of the technology? Yes, it's, it's open for the public. It runs uh, 12 hours every day, seven days a week. And uh, anybody can jump on and jump off. Your test is quite similar to the tests of Vimo and Google in uh, California. Or, or is the technology more or less advanced than compared to the, the test in the USA or the Pacific Rim? In, in well, Waymo has more advanced technology than we do. Uh, so they have cars that can handle more scenarios than ours. 
but they are also driving on public roads and and you can access them if you're part of their test community so they have limited the number of people who can take the autonomous waymos can you can you give us here in germany a general impression of the situation in the nordic countries what are the main uh, factors for the establishment of autonomous driving No, I, I, I think in the Nordics, what you'll see happening is city centers will be closed off to private cars. And in order for that to be effective, you need to have autonomous shuttles and cars and maybe bigger buses that connect existing systems such as trams, metros, regular trains, and the big buses on the bus rapid transit lines. So... Autonomous systems will essentially enhance and augment the public transportation system in cities in the Nordic. Talk a bit about the uh, time horizons, which are um, in play, uh, which are discussed in the Nordic countries. Uh, then, when will it? When will the bodies of the or the, the government? When will provi um, prevent private cars from entering? The cities in the next 10 or 20 years. Jo, hier ist das Ende erreicht diese Episode aus der Podcast-Reihe Die Zukunftsversion. Hier endet der freie Teil. Weiter geht's auf meinen Webseiten ähm, elektroauto.org slash Zukunftsmobilisten oder ähm, automatisiertesauto.de slash Zukunftsmobilisten. Da kann man sich die vollständigen Interviews äh, gegen eine kleine Gebühr anhören. Ich habe auch eine Staffelung drin, also Menschen im AG 1 und 2 Bezug zahlen weniger als auch Studenten und Doktoranden. Schüler sind auch günstiger. Ja, ich freue mich aufs nächste Mal, wenn es wieder hier bei den Zukunftsmobilisten ein neues Interview gibt. Bis dann, tschüss.